I'll just uh, I'll field any questions by groups. Did this this group have any questions? Yeah. Not so far. Okay. Uh, you guys? <laughs> any, <laughs> all right. <laughs> any any questions? Objections? Back there. I I have I have a, a few, and I think you. My, I, Okay. No. Please. You go ahead first. Um, I was just wondering how nationalism falls into this idea of class of class with. Um, I mean, it's yeah. it's very easy to, to to focus on American workers rather than. Yeah, you, you were referring to American workers, and you said like peasants don't really exist in America, but in southern Mexico, peasants still exist. Now, you know, like absolutely. So I'm talking about like industrial, like the workers of the world unite. I'm talking about like well. How's nationalism? I don't, I don't really know Marxist theories on nationalism and what he thought would end up with. Well, there are two. Borders and stuff. Yeah, there are actually two big breaks that occur with Lenin. Um, now, keep in mind, Marx died before this century began. And I believe Engels also died. And so their legacy was passed on to Karl Kutuski. And Karl Kutuski was this head of a really successful social democrat, because that's what the communists were called back then, the Social Democratic Party. And Lenin was this very marginal figure in this really pretty unsuccessful, you know, social democratic party in Russia. Then World War I breaks out. And every good, honest communist is faced with this question, which is what does one, as a communist, do when you have these various powers fighting each other? Now, the Social Democrats, right, who claim to be the Kutuskiists, who claim to be good Marxists, said, well, look, here's the thing. If you don't go to war, right, your nation will be destroyed and your industry will be destroyed and your lives will be destroyed. So you go to war, but only tactically, for now, right, until, of course, we, we come together at some point in the future after all these wars and, uh, you know, then we can be friends. But you need to defend your country, right? You need to defend yourself. And so this was one view, right, which became uh, what Lenin would call a social chauvinistic view. Lenin said, no, you don't need to defend your country. Not only do you not need to defend your country, you should actively work for your country to fail and lose. Uh, and you should not be concerned about your elites. You should not be concerned about your nation, about your position. You should be concerned about international solidarity with the workers. As I'm sure you can tell by how I characterize them, I am strongly in favor of that view, that it doesn't matter that I'm American. It is only a coincidental fact. And in fact, uh, you know, I, I talked to the Nepalese, and I said, what can I do to help aid you in your revolution in Nepal, right? Um, I'm trained with weapons. I'm a, a good writer. I'd be more than willing to do, you know, websites for them. And without exception, the Maoists said, the thing that you can do to protect us the best is go make revolution in your country. Because that's going to be the only thing that can defend us against American and Indian imperialism. So for me, at least, it is absolutely unimportant what sort of nationality we are, what sort of ethnicity we are. Uh, again, class. For me, it's about class. And so I, I have more solidarity with Mexican peasants, literal peasants, uh, maquilladora workers on the border, than I do with Ken Garf or anyone, anyone who has any power or importance here in Utah County, Utah, or the United States. Does that? I was just curious. I was just curious. Yeah. But there are different strains. Yeah. yeah. Do you know where Lenin wrote about that? Um, actually, the National Chauvinism, he, I believe he wrote about it, no, I'm not two steps forward, one step back. Um, if you go to the Marxist Internet Archive, you can definitely find it in, um, in there, just in the war periods. It'll probably, I, I believe it's starred. It's an imperialism high stage capital. You can also definitely find aspects of it in State and Revolution. So State and Revolution is a good introduction to Leninist thought. And he also addressed the Kachuskiist uh, betrayal, essentially, is what he characterizes it as. So State and Revolution, I, I highly recommend. Um, just to start off, um, 
when you talk about orthodox Marxist, it, you outlined a, a bunch of different, um, and I just wondered, for you, is Lenin orthodox Marxist? Mm -hmm. Is his notion of class, it, it, is his, is Trotsky's, is Mao, like, how do those three, because I, I, I sensed in the other, in the other three that they definitely deviate from that. Um, but I also sense that maybe these guys uh, tried to make that a little bit more sophisticated rather than simplified. Right. Which, which I think Marx himself, at certain times, in certain of his writings, actually does provide a, like a more sociological view, like, as you mentioned, with the lumpet, you know, he talks about the lumpet uh, proletariat and the petty bourgeoisie, but then at other times, when he's making the call to arms, he makes friends and foes. Yeah. And, oh, sorry. Uh, I, I guess I, the way I'm reading you is maybe even though they um, looked at it in a more complex way than simply bourgeois proletariat, they did it in, in order to try to find a revolutionary class or to form a revolutionary class. Whereas what you tend to suggest, what you're suggesting about the ultra leftists, the pro structuralists, and maybe the sociologists, is that they're trying to avoid. They're trying to say this is why we can't have revolution. Well, because, and, and I just wondered if you. Well, it, I, I, I want to give some. Then I, I, then I see that the malice and the post structuralists. Well, for one, I think the post structuralists viewed themselves maybe not hard and angry, but the ones that were first called that, Leotard aside, as malice, and that's what they were taking a cue from. Malice. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, to give some credit to Negri and Hart, um, what what. What a lot of the post-structuralists see, they see this as a problem with orthodox Marxism, which is it can become too dogmatic. That one is constantly searching for the real, real industrial workers, right, who are really the proletariat, and you dismiss out of hand everything else, right? Um, which Marx was accused of, which Lenin, of course, makes that next break that says, no, the peasants can have a tactical, right, alliance. But it's Mao that makes that serious break, which says, no, it's not about searching for this industrial purity, right? It's about forming the proletariat as a class, which entails accepting contingent that they subordinate their will to communist revolution, right, to the proletariat. Other revolutionary classes, those classes that fight imperialism, and in, in that respect, protect the proletariat, are revolutionary in those actions. Um, whereas um, those peasants that withhold food to starve out the cities to get what they want, in that instance, would not be revolutionary, right? The contradiction there would have become antagonistic. So that's what they see. They see it as, right, an avoidance of dogmatism. Um, but my contention is that in avoiding class as class, Right, they render the very notion of revolution absurd. If we're judged by capitalist actions and communist actions, the biggest capitalist in the world, Bill Gates, is also the biggest communist in the world. Because nobody's given more money to people, nobody's built more infrastructure than Bill Gates. And so in or if one avoids the class analysis of class, comp of class composition as such, I feel that we're left with nothing but sophistry and just an empty, vague void of which one can then ascribe anything to anything. Um, and so, so would it be self, self um, because it's not, it's not about precision, it's about call to arms, would it be some, to, some, like, to what extent would it be self-defining? Well, I mean, the, the problem with vulgar Marxism was not Marx, was not maybe some of the leading theoreticians, but within Marxist circles, people would be accusing each other of not being proletarian. Oh, yeah, well, you know, I know that your uncle happens to own this and that, so therefore you're not a true proletarian. Or, right, those kind of, there's, those kind of accusations would fly, and they're, um, thereby orthodoxy formed a certain sort of something you couldn't be like a shame about this, that, Does that Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely, uh, I absolutely agree with that. In fact, one of the theoretical works I'm working on is how a rigid notion of class composition necessarily leads to Stalinism, to authoritarianism. 
I think Mao, I think Mao finds a way out of that. 